but we all like coffee because we're all physicists. <laughs> well, I'm employed by math department. So, uh, although, I don't know, if you look at my CV, it's like PRA, all that stuff. So I don't know who I think I'm kidding. But uh, yes, I'm in the Department of Mathematics. UNO ad just started recently. So first, I just want to say, you know, thank you to Quill, thanks to Mark and Ryan for organizing this. I'm really excited about quantum information here in southern Louisiana. I think we've got a lot of good people um, in the region, and uh, it's great that we're doing Quill and uh, you know all coming together. I, I really feel like you know we can get a lot of cool stuff going on in the next few years, many years. So uh, thanks for giving me a talk today. And um, yeah, and I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on you know Mark's introduction, you know, just talk a little bit about my recent path, because I think it's relevant to a lot of people in this room that I got you know, my PhD at Tulane uh, in the math department, you know, but you know, we're talking about LSU, Tulane, and um, so you'll see I finished in August 2014, did not quite make the cutoff for May, normal graduation. So Unfortunately, I did not get to don the robes, the PhD robes, but uh, that was okay. And uh, you'll notice another deficiency. There's a little five-month gap between August and January, so uh, <laughs> so let's let's not worry too much about that either. Because once I did get to Boulder, it was uh, I had a really good time there. Um, you know, so the, so the work I did as a graduate student really prepared me to uh, come in and start working with these, you know, really good experimentalists and contribute to their projects and uh, get some nice publications. And so I was there for three and a half years. And um, yeah, we did a lot of cool stuff. So you, know, you can come out of here and uh, go pay your dues somewhere like Colorado, maybe come back. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this time around, I have kids, so no gaps allowed. I can't lose my health insurance. Uh, my wife made clear on that. So, so yeah, so ever since uh, August, I've been an assistant professor at the math department here at UNO. So uh, I'm here, uh, it's great to be meeting all of you, and I look forward to continuing to uh, you know, elaborate and talk to people. So uh, today's talk is on you know, Belmont locality and quantum information theory. This uh, goes to the big loophole free test of Bell's inequality that I was a part of on the theory side. This was our experiment in Boulder. My friend Chris Richon, uh, lead experimentalist on that. So that was a big publication in Physical Review Letters. Uh, it's really a landmark. This was the first loophole-free test of Bell's inequality, although I don't really like the terminology loophole-free. It sounds sort of like a little joke or, you know, I mean, really what this is is the first time that we're seeing, you know, bona fide black box non-locality in experiments. It was expected, but this is the first sort of black box demonstration of it. So we'll talk a little bit about a loophole-free Bell test inequality and how we can apply that to a device-independent random number generation system. And that was uh, that was my big capstone project at uh, NIST. So so I'm happy that that was just earlier this year we got that published. So so we'll talk about loophole-free Bell test and how that applies to making a device-independent random number generation. So you might be thinking, okay, random number generator, big deal. Okay, well, you know, how do you make a quantum random number generator? It's not that hard. You know, you could have a photon detector and a polarizing filter, and you could shoot a photon, you know, through, and maybe half the time it goes through, half the time it doesn't. This perfect quantum randomness, you know, no biggie. Uh, so I've drawn, you know, a notice I've drawn a horizontal photon. This will just slide right through and be detected with probability one. You know, and you can also have a vertical photon, and this will slide and get splat, get stopped. You will not detect it with probability one. But what we know how to do is have a special magical uh, superposition state photon. This is an equal superposition of up and down, and there's a 50-50% chance that it goes through here, and you know, you'll get your nice quantum coin flip, and there are you know, commercially available, I think, quantum random number generators exploiting you know, variations on this theme of measuring a two-level system and inspecting its, uh, you know, the randomness. And, you know, quantum mechanics, the orthodox interpretation, tells us there's no way to predict what's going to happen in advance. You know, there's no hidden variables. This is just going to 
This guy's gonna get here, it's gonna make some on-the-fly decision about whether or not to go through with probability 50, 50, no way to predict it in advance, you get your nice random numbers. So there's a couple issues with this. One of them is, you know, how do you know you have this state? Well, you compare it, you know, but you, know, you can't really sort of like shine some photons on your photon to, uh, to look at it and make sure that it's still in your superposition state. You, you, you can't really see it or you might wind up measuring it by accident in advance. So you have to trust that, you know, whatever photon you prepared in advance is, you know, still in this perfectly entangled state and um, that's sort of a trust in your equipment. And that's uh, sort of a subtle problem. You could have, uh, this could start turning into, you know, instead of this state, it could start turning into, you know, alternations between this state and this state. Maybe there's some classical noise infected in your system. And if I, you know, want to hack your random number generator, and I, you know, use the binary digits of pi to send you this state and this state, you know, in random sequence, I can predict exactly what your random number generator is. And unless you're looking to see whether or not this is the binary expansion of pi, it's just going to look like random numbers to you. You're not going to, you're going to think you have this, but there's really no way to distinguish this after the fact from just, you know, alternating between these in some sort of random sequence. There's a, so this is where we get the term device independent. You, you don't need to have so much trust in your device if you do a quantum random number generator the way I'm going to tell you. Another related issue here is, you know, sort of Einstein's critique of quantum mechanics. Who's to say that we're not going to come up with a more complete theory that, you know, there's some hidden variable buried in this, right? This entangled state that when it gets here, you know, there's someone who has some post-quantum theory of quantum physics, or, you know, that, that says, ah, you know, every entangled state has buried in it some hidden variables that we can look at that tell us whether or not it's going to go through here. You know, quantum physics is just an incomplete theory, and so someday someone's going to come along and be able to predict this stuff. So there's sort of a related foundations critique to, you know, how much trust should we have in this random number generator to generate random numbers. So what we're going to do is, you know, notice I said, like, hidden variable, you know, there's a hidden variable that would help you predict what the output of this is. We're going to leverage the Bell experiment to build a really good random number generator. And we're going to build a random number generator that's so good that you cannot predict the output with some more advanced theory of physics unless that more advanced theory of physics would enable sending signals faster than the speed of light. So, so that that so you know, we're going to build a random number generator that you know we're going to see some effects, some physical effects. We're going to look at the data and we're going to say any way that you could predict this output in advance would require some post-quantum theory that would enable faster than light signaling. We know that is basically not going to happen. Uh, uh, so you just have to assume that everything's random. Random in the sense you cannot predict it in advance. That before the experiment was run, there was no information that would help you know what the output would be. So this comes to a Bell experiment. Um, Here's a quantum non-locality experiment. Now we have uh, Alice, she's got her uh, photon detector and her polarizing filter, and a distant separated Bob, who's got the same apparatus. And now there's some photon source in the middle that's sending out entangled photons, one to each. And that's gonna be our basic scheme. And it's important that they're separated because that's where we're gonna get into this. They can't be signaling faster than the speed of light, and so therefore, so, you know, we actually do this. Here's the picture of the building. Alice is in this corner of uh, this L-shaped building. It would actually be better if it was just a long building in a line, but, you know, this is the building we were given. And so Bob's over here. His sorts of entangled photons are in the corner of this building. And so, you know, every experimental trial, a photon pair is created by this laser. You know, so one goes down this fiber optic cable here, and they do a measurement. Another one goes down this fiber optic cable here and they do a measurement. We are uh, cooling our detectors down to one Kelvin. So the previous speaker was talking about, you know, that's hard to do. And it is hard to do. It creates a lot of headaches for my experimentalist colleagues. But um, it's the only way to get the efficiency necessary to run this experiment in full free. So, so, so the bottom line is Alice and Bob are separated a long distance, 185 meters from each other. 
And so we're going to run this experiment in such a way that we're going to basically measure photon pairs simultaneously, or as close to simultaneously as we can, so that little hidden signals, if they were traveling between Alice and Bob, affecting our experiment, those little hidden signals, if they really expect our, affect our experiment, would have to be going faster than the speed of light. And so that's going to be our angle. So, um, so let's go back to this schematic diagram. So we've got the photon source in the middle, Alice and Bob, and our experiment is actually fairly straightforward. These are click detectors. In a single experimental trial, either you see a click or you don't. So, you know, there's only four possibilities, right? One is that both detectors click, so goes off, goes off. We call that a plus-plus outcome. Perhaps only Alice's detector clicks and Bob sees no click. We call that a plus-zero. Vice versa, maybe only Bob clicks and not Alice. We call that a zero-plus. And then, of course, uh, you could have neither detector click. Okay, so four outcomes, and there's one more aspect, is we have a measurement setting. These polarizers can be rotated, and that's the other sort of angle here. So I've pictured them unrotated, we'll call that Alice measuring angle A and Bob measuring angle B. So that's our first setting. We can also have Bob rotate this polarizer to a specified uh, angle beforehand, we'll call that angle B prime, and so that would be the configuration A, B prime, Alice is unrotated, Bob is rotated, and so that could be the setting where we would see any of these four outcomes. And, you know, Alice could rotate, Bob non, call that A prime, B prime, or they could both rotate, and then we call that setting A prime, B prime. So each experimental uh, trial, we have four different measurement configurations, four different outcomes, there's only 16 different things that could happen. And the key here to remember is Alice and Bob are able to switch between these settings really quick. They use something called a popple cell, which is like sort of an electronic way of affecting a polarizer. And it can be turned on and off really fast. And so in a single trial, the photon's generated in the middle and it's going towards Alice, it's going towards Alice. And right before it gets to Alice, Bob, quote, decides whether he's going to rotate or not. And so when Alice detects her thing, Bob's decision of whether to rotate his polarizer or not should not affect Alice's probability of getting a click. Why not? Well, suppose instead of doing a quantum random number generator experiment, we wanted to build a signaling faster than the speed of light experiment, and we had a situation where Bob could just turn this polarizer on and off, and all of a sudden that would affect Alice's probability of getting a click long before any hypothetical signal from Bob turning on or off his polarizer would have traveled to Alice if that signal's going slower than the speed of light. Kind of forgot the structure of my sentence, but you know, Bob <laughs> should not be able to send signals to Alice faster than the speed of light by uh, switching his polarizer on and off. And if her detection probability is changing based on his polarizer being on or off, then she's knowing whether or not that's happening, and so that's the signal faster than the speed of light. It can be noisy, but you know, if that probability changes, all of a sudden you've got a noisy telephone. So, um, so that can't happen. And so I'm talking about probabilities, right? So let's, let's look at this in terms of the experimental outcomes we actually expect to see and how we're going to compare that and stack that up against uh, you know, this phenomenon of no signaling leading to randomness. So let's start with a simple example. Here's a simple example where each row is a probability distribution. I have ones in this column, right? So if the setting is A, B, then the probability of seeing a double click is going to be plus, plus, right? Uh, it's going to be uh, one. And then nothing else happens. So this could be a scenario where maybe you're shining a bright flashlight at both detectors. And this is the way these detectors work. If, you know, shoot a thousand photons at any sort of detector, it's going to go off at every time, you know, and they'll just go right through that polarizer, at least some of them, and set, set it off. So there's no randomness here, but this is a perfectly valid experimental distribution. Just instead of making sure everything's dark in the lab, you just turn the lights on and your photon detectors are just going to go off every time. So, so there's one example of a probability distribution. Certainly nothing random about this. Not a random number generator. Here's another simple example. Turn off the lights and make sure it's dark, and you won't get any photons. Okay. All right, 
Uh, no, don't even get me turned on dark sounds, okay. Let's, for the sake of argument, you turn off the light, you won't see any photons, so with probability one, no matter what your setting is, no photons are gonna travel in your thing, with probability one, you see no photons. Okay, so now let's go to something that maybe looks a little bit random, but isn't. Is there randomness in this distribution? Okay, so here's a thing where now all of a sudden, you know, when the setting's A, B, half the time you're seeing a double count, half the time you're seeing nothing, right? Or if the setting's A prime, B prime, half the time you're seeing a double count, half the time you're seeing nothing. And, you know, maybe you're measuring spin up, spin down, and it's perfectly correlated, and it's weird and random. Or, you know, maybe someone's just turning the lights on and off, right? You don't need quantum magic to explain this distribution. The above distribution can be decomposed into deterministic distributions. You know, we have the one where the lights are on and the one where the lights are off. So if you're just, you know, studiously taking notes at Bob and you see this random pattern between zero zeros and plus pluses, you know, then you've just got some goofball at the source lab just going, you know, shining a flashlight into your thing or not shining a flashlight into your thing. They'll give you this distribution without using any quantum mechanics or non-locality or anything. Certainly not any randomness. It might look random, but it's predictable. You know, this guy's just looking at a preloaded table of digits that are random, and he's you know shining the flashlight on and off into your fiber optics to give you a distribution that looks like this, but it's perfectly predictable to him. So, you know, distributions can look like this and not have any you know irreducible randomness in them. So now let's consider this distribution, and this distribution is special. What's special about this? You know, you might look at this and say, okay, let's try to do what he did with the first distribution and you know, decompose this into you know, two deterministic distributions. So remember the one half was sort of in the middle on this bottom row. So maybe we could say, okay, is this a possible decomposition? We have you know, half the time there's something that's deterministically causing this And the other half of the time, we have like maybe a different state or a different hidden variable that causes this distribution. But there's a problem, and here's the problem. When Bob chooses B prime, Alex can signal Bob. So I want to take a minute and really go through this, because this is sort of the crux of the matter. Okay, so we've had this thing with one half, one half, and we're trying to sort of decompose it into some pre-existing information that we don't actually have bell pairs or whatever. We just have, you know, some state that deterministically gives you this based on these measurement settings, right? And you have some other state that deterministically gives you this for these di different measurement settings. And maybe which state we're in is one of these two, and that's sort of randomly toggling at the beginning. And if you knew which state you were in, you would be able to perfectly predict the output. But that can't happen, because when Bob chooses B prime, Alice can signal Bob. So let's suppose you knew what the local hidden variable was, and it was this state, you know. So, you know, we have this thing that's a mixture, and we, we know it's just, say, a decomposition of some state that gives you this, and some state that gives you this half the time. Now, if you know in advance what state it is, suppose, suppose Bob knows in advance that this is the state that's happening, and he sets this thing on B prime, okay. And now, all of a sudden, he's on B prime, and he sees a plus. And he knows that the state that was in the pipe is the one that does this. If he sees a plus, he knows he needs to be in this column. If he sees a zero, and he's selected B prime, he knows all of a sudden now that he's in this column. So he knows that this is the state, and he knows that you know if I see a plus, Alice chose A, and if I see a zero, Alice chose A prime. That's the only way. That's the name of the game here. This is, this is signaling. Now remember, Alice only chose her basis right before Bob's you know, measurement event. And so she can, she can toggle that on and off you know, a split second before Bob sees a plus or a zero. And so if all of a sudden, you know, if Bob knows that and he's on B prime, and Alice wants to send him some yes or no message faster than the speed of light, she can do that if he knows this decomposed state, right? But if it's not decomposed, if we do not try to decompose the distribution, Bob's probability of a plus is independent of Alice's setting choice. Okay? So if we don't force this into some decomposition of deterministic things, now all of a sudden Bob's, he's not getting anything. It's B prime, he chooses B prime. Half the time he sees a plus, and half the time he sees a zero. If Alice chooses A. 
And if Alice chooses a prime, half the time he sees a plus and half the time he sees a zero. Right? He's not getting any information about Alice's setting choice. So long as we just assume that this is random and not you know, traceable to some pre-existing information. This is why Bell's inequality rules out local hidden variable theories. Because quantum mechanics can create distributions like this, not exactly this one, but if distributions that are effectively like this, you can create them in quantum mechanics. And then if you try to remove the randomness in terms of a local hidden variable theory that would help you predict the outcome, the very process of removing that randomness gives you a faster than light signaling machine. And so that's why it's kind of cool and important to run a loophole free Bell test where we actually separate our things in such a way that there isn't enough time for faster than light signals to travel because then we can really say faster than light's what you would need. So you can run a Bell test on a tabletop and you know the knot space like separated the two ends. So you know seeing something like this wouldn't actually violate faster than light signals. But you know we are very careful to space like separate our measurement nodes. Okay, so um, so if we so so the bottom line is if we disallow signaling between Alice and Bob, we must accept that there is randomness in the distribution. And that was sort of my promised nugget at the beginning. You know, we want randomness, and we're going to get randomness such that we can say the only way this randomness isn't random, i.e., predictable, is if we have a machine that can, you know, allow signaling faster than the speed of light. So before I move on, are there any questions? I, I really wanted to kind of hammer this point home. It's kind of the meat, really the point. I have, it might be a little bit unrelated, but what do you mean, entanglement or quantum correlation? To do this? Uh, well, not exactly that, to do random, to extract random numbers. Uh, for this, you would need entanglement in order to get non-locality, in order to get this kind of irreducible randomness. Now, of course, if quantum mechanics is a complete theory, then you don't need entanglement, you just need a superposition state. You know, if you believe that you can't predict the outcomes of superposition states, which I think most people do. Um, but if you want to get this randomness that you can certify without having to believe anything about quantum mechanics and only having to believe that faster than light signaling is possible, you need entanglement because you need non-locality. Uh, yes. Well, another question, uh, what's the role of the dimensionality? If you increase your Hilbert space, do you get more randomness? Not for the 2-2 two -two experiment, because you can get um, the, so the, again, this is like better than quantum mechanics, this distribution. Quantum mechanics gets noisy here, um, but you can already get the best quantum distribution for this with a singlet state, giving you like, if you were trying to do like two entangled photons to Alice, two entangled photons to Bob, you couldn't do any better than the singlet state in terms of you know getting the most non without changing the number of settings or the number of parties. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a question just to clarify on the technical level. So you, you're using this term irreducible randomness. Yeah. So I should understand that is it cannot be decomposed into a convex combination of determinants with no signaling action. Yes, that's okay. exactly what it means. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so uh, anything else? Uh, So again, I repeat, if we disallow signaling between Alice and Bob, we must accept that there is irreducible randomness in this distribution. Turning it into a convex combination of deterministic things give you signaling deterministic things. Okay, but I've already alluded to this. We can't get this distribution. Here's what we can get. Okay, expected experimental distribution. All right, noisy and gross. You know, if we could get this, I wouldn't have a job. Uh, you know, so it's teasing the randomness out of this that's uh, really tough, because that previous thing was basically a coin flip, ready to go. But there's randomness buried in this, okay, and, you know, it's buried by a lot of noise. In fact, you know, there's lots of zero, zero outcomes. You know, take any sort of probability distance you want, okay? Good morning. Hi. <laughs> All your students have turned to you and... <laughs> <laughs> Probability distance measure you want, this is very close to the 
slides off distribution, right? 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, very close to 1, 1, 1, 1. So we have a lot of noise, not very much signal. The lights off distribution is obviously nothing cool about that. So we need to separate this out from the lights off distribution and you know, find that cool U of one half that's buried in this distribution. And it's there, it's like maybe 0. 0.0002 of this distribution is that cool U, okay? So here's what we do, um, you know, I think it's like 10 minutes. I want five minutes maybe? 10 is fine. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, so what we do, what I did, I guess, is uh, construct a special score function T. We just have a little score for every possible outcome. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, goes from settings and outcomes. So, you know, first trial. Maybe we do setting A prime B pre B and we get outcome plus zero. We have a score for that. It's 0.9955. Another trial, another setting, another outcome combination, we have a score for that. You know, so we run four trials, we run 160 million trials, each time we have a score, right? And so what's special about this score function is just that for deterministic non-random distributions, like either the, you know, the lights off distribution or the lights on distribution or 50-50 of those two, for any of those, the expected value of this T score function is less than or equal to one. But for random non-signaling distributions, like the special one I showed you with the off-kilter one half at the bottom, you can get an expectation value of this t that's a little bit bigger than one. So we have a method for finding this function. And so that means if we run this experiment and we see scores that are tending to be larger than one, we can maybe, hopefully, infer that there's some randomness in this distribution. And that's indeed what we do. So, you know, we run our trials, trial one, we get this score, trial two, we get this score, trial three, we get one, you know, we, and what our cumulative score is gonna be the product of all these t's, right? And so if it's non-random, the t's are one or less. If it's random, the t's can be a little bit bigger than one. And so we end up getting some cumulative t-score that's a lot bigger than one. And so we, you know, we see that that's giving us a signal of randomness in our distribution. And here's the theorem that I prove about it. Um, suppose this is a Bell function satisfying those conditions I just said. Then basically, and this is another place where I might want to just take a second. Um, it's very likely that we are in this situation. Okay. So this is the probability of a probability, right? So it's highly probable, right? Greater than one minus e, that our outcome string, which is this, which is just, you know, these turned into binary form. It's highly probable that our outcome string wasn't very likely. So, so the outcome string, you know, if the outcome string happens with probability one, then it's not random. If the outcome string is boundable in its probability, then, you know, then we're good. We've got some randomness. And so this is sort of just saying it's, you know, this theorem says that we can bound the likelihood of our outcome string with high probability. So there's, a, there's some error probability, because even a local living variable theory can get lucky with probability one over 100 trillion or whatever. Yeah. So, so you can never make this probability one. But that's okay, you know, so there's just a little epsilon at the end of your protocol. So, okay, good. How does that little epsilon not affect things? Like, suppose you want it really, really small, what, what do you have to think? Just the usual way, you know, there's more no free trials. lunch. So, so yeah, more trials is good if you want more randomness. Or you could loosen this bound and that would give you F as a decreasing function. So then, you know, if you make epsilon smaller, that means F smaller, or bigger. Yeah, if you make epsilon bigger, if you make this a worse bound, then you get a better bound on your randomness. Because this function is decreasing as a function of the number of trials n, m being a parameter of the t function. <coughs> How do you arrive at this F function? Um, I don't know. It just, I proved it. So I mean, this all dates back to some uh, statistics that people developed for um, ruling out local hidden variable theories. Yeah. And so that's where the score function kind of comes from originally. So, so it's just like, is, is it somehow a natural function? Like, is, is it something you're expected to do improve? Or I don't, just trying to understand what this function is. So there, I mean, it 
you know, um, they had a way of doing this before with some statistics that didn't work very well. So I kind of walked through the steps of their proof and see if I could adapt it to this product statistic, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get lucky. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, intuition, though, that's. assumption which says that the settings, our choice of the settings, has to be independent of pre-existing information about the states being measured. It's a little bit of a technicality, but it's a, a pretty well-motivated assumption. And, um, you can sort of decide how you want to measure a photon, and the photon, you know, when it's generated, doesn't even one more thing about it. You see we're bounding the probability from above, but this is not telling us that we have this you know, perfect 50-50 like, thing, which is what you would want for you know, something you could actually use for, say, creating a secret key or whatever you do with random numbers. So you know, we've got a, our raw theorem tells us that we have a distribution like this, that no outcome is particularly likely. You know, so all the outcomes are bounded by a certain amount. So we need to hash it down some way or another to something where this is a probability distribution over shorter strings. So we take our raw output string, which has a probability distribution like this, according to the Anthropic Production Theorem, hash it down to something that's more closely uniform, and then this is the final output that we can use for you know, our actual random number generator machine. And so these are the bits we got from about 10 minutes of data with something like 160 million trials. These bits are uniform to within 10 to the minus 12, measured according to total variation distance. And you could not have predicted these numbers before sometime in March of this year, unless you had the ability to send signals faster than the speed of light. So I mean, that's cool. This is true randomness. You know. If you can't send signals faster than the speed of light, those numbers are random. But this is also applicable because it gives you kind of a fail-safe for an experimenter. You know, if you're building a random number generating machine, if you're not violating the bell inequality, throw that run out. You only use it if you're violating the bell inequality, and then you know you have randomness. Whereas the simple random number generator doesn't tell you when it stops working. I mean, if it starts getting really biased, it does, but it could stop working without being so clear about that. Um, could you go back two slides? Um, and, 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 yeah, that one. And yeah. Am I seeing a vessel sink square or sink squared function uh, env en enveloping the amplitude in that top graph for some reason? No, uh, this is just, it. so the, what's special about this is that no single outcome is likelier than 0.25. Uh, I get that, but why, why is it following a sink squared envelope? Why is it going down like this? Well, it's, it's yeah, I was trying to be a little cute. So these have more zeros in them. And so our output data tends to have more zeros in it. So it is a little bit skewed like that. Keep asking why it wiggles up and down. Yeah, why is it a sync squared function? I, I think I wanted it to look noisy. <laughs> <laughs> but I literally typed these probabilities in by hand just to give an example <laughs> of the probability. Just you are very hard random number generator. <laughs> <laughs> See, yes, that's why we need to have it. <laughs> yeah, that's why we need this. So whatever you're seeing, it's just it doesn't mean anything. That's all that's special about this. I just typed up some numbers that no one of them is greater than 0.25, and they all add up to one. That's it. So uh, here's the random bits. And you know we have a self-testing random number generator. You can use public input randomness. OK, this is the catch, right? We needed to be using toggling our settings. We needed randomness for that. OK, you're getting randomness out, but you had to put randomness in. But the randomness you put in can be weak randomness. It doesn't need to be unpredictable to everybody. It just needs to be uncorrelated from the photon states you're measuring to. 
you're willing to make that assumption, you can use a public stream of randomness, and then you get this great private output randomness completely untraceable. And uh, OK, so that pretty much sums it up. This is uh, future directions. We still have some uh, protocol refining we can do here. And we've got three-party non-locality, starting to think about that. You know, instead of Alice and Bob, we have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Do some stuff with GHZ. You know, how does some of this stuff translate up? I've also been working with Omar on quantum metrology. So, um, yeah, lots of cool stuff going on. Um, I'm here. Thank you. I want to be, you know, I'm just down the street. So I want to be a resource. Anyone who's interested in this, you know, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. And, uh,